Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on the Comprehensive Job Creation Plan. Um, today is Wednesday, April 18th, 2018. I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee, by my lonesome today so far. Um, I don't expect that uh, we will have a quorum. We have some conflicting committees uh, going on right now, but we're going to go ahead and proceed with the two items on the agenda. And uh, before we do anything else, I would like to take up our public comment. So um, we do have a card on item number one, Shane Phillips. Uh, Mr. Chair, Richard Williams, City Clerk's Office, would you like the item number one read into the record? Yes, why don't we go ahead and do that? As Mr. Phillips making his way up. Item number one is City Planning Department report relative to the creation of an administrative process for issuing over the counter on site alcohol conditional use permits. Good afternoon. Go right ahead, Council Member. Um, I'm Shane Phillips with Central City Association. We're here today to support the proposed administrative process for on site alcohol consumption. Uh, the new process would significantly reduce the cost and delay of opening new restaurants while still requiring businesses to meet very strict regulations and operate as good neighbors in their communities. Uh, the current process associated with CUBs is cost and time prohibitive for many, especially those lacking traditional financial backing or city permitting expertise. Right now, too many potential operators can't take the chance to open a new restaurant because of the risk of our discretionary process. We believe our best planning happens when we establish standards and expectations up front so that operators can count on a fair, objective process and know that if they play by the rules, they'll be able to move forward. Uh, this proposal achieves that goal, so we hope that, I guess if you can't vote on it today, um, whenever you have a quorum, you're able to approve this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your support. Um, okay, if there's no other cards on item number one. No, sir. Okay, so we'll close comment on item number one. There's no cards on number two. No, sir. We'll close uh, comment on number two. Is there any general public comment today? Uh, no, sir, there is not. All right, general public comment is closed. Um, so um, we'll go ahead and take up uh, item number two, I think, out of order. So, Mr. Williams, if you go ahead and read that one in. Item number two is the Chief Legislative Analyst Status Report relative to the Citywide Comprehensive Job Creation Plan. Um, I appreciate all of your being here. It's nice to see so many people here at once who are all working on this, uh, this objective, and um, it's good to have you all here. We'll try and move expeditiously, given that there's so many of you and so few of us. Uh, but I do want to say, first of all, just thank all of you, because it's been now a year and a half uh, since the Council ad adopted uh, the uh, um, plan that that we put forth and um, we're what's important is uh, not simply to make the policy but also to figure out how to implement the policies in a way that is effective and that's where all of you come in and what I want to try to get a little bit of an update on today and hear the progress that we're making on each of the different elements of uh, the proposals that have come out of this committee so um, why don't we go ahead and, and do them in the order of recommendations, starting with 1A, creating a centralized business unit, and lead department for that will be EWDD and CLA. So if I could ask you, the appropriate representatives, to come on forward on that. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Kukrain, if it's okay, I was just going to give a little short Yes, background. please. No, that, that's, that's what I was hoping, yes. We're pleased to, Dora Huerta with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, today we're pleased to present a status update with the progress made to date <coughs> on the goals of the Jobs and Business Advancement in Los Angeles Action Plan adopted by Council in 2016. The 2000 16 plan includes 14 strategies and maps out the short and long-term steps that departments will undertake to better assist businesses and promote job creation in the city. When the jobs plan was approved in 2016, in 2016, council instructed each department lead to report on its respective strategy on a quarterly basis. At the request of uh, this committee's chair, our office has worked with the department leads and helped compile the strategy updates before you. 
the department leads and other departments that have contributed toward each strategy are present to answer any specific questions you may have relative to these updates. I will now turn it over to Sam Hughes from EWDD to go over strategy 1A, centralizing, uh, creating a centralized business unit. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Dorian. Welcome. Thank you, Councilman Kokorian. Good to be here. Um, and certainly in the interest of time, I'll briefly provide an overview of item 1A, 1B, and um, 1C. And at that point, I'll ask um, other city departments, namely uh, GSD and the CAO, to come up. As it relates to 1A, to create a centralized business unit, including rapid response service for businesses, uh, the newly established business assistance unit under the direction of the Assistant Chief Grants Administrator within the EWDD um, is actively working to design and implement a new jobs and economic development initiative zone program, the rapid response program, small business commission, and um, potential CREA, EIFD, and opportunity zone programs all of the three, the latter three of which are, are subject to council approval. Um, year to date, EWD has filled four of the seven positions. EWD continues to work with its personnel division to fill the vacant positions within this particular business unit. Uh, the following positions remain vacant, namely a management assistant position. Um, interestingly enough, this position is vacant only after a promotion of the last incumbent. So someone was in a position and they got a promotion and so now it's, it's vacant. But again, we're working with the person, our personnel division uh, to replace this person. Uh, secondly, the management analyst position and lastly, a senior project coordinator. So of the seven positions, uh, four are filled and we will soon um, fill in the other three. Uh, with respect to the rapid response officer, um, they have identified liaisons and compiled the contact list of various city departments that play a role in assisting businesses in the city. Uh, the list is available and currently is used through the business referral system. Uh, spring of last year, the unit established the, refer the referral protocols uh, to assist businesses struggling with meeting city requirements or that need help in navigating the different city departments as required to open or expand a business. And so at the appropriate time, EWD actually hopes to provide a comprehensive report on the success of the, report, the referral program um, as it relates and as, it, as we look at um, just the monitoring and possibly tracking the number of businesses using the system. Uh, certainly, um, it needs to be user friendly on the one hand you, to identify a business that needs help and plug them into the system is great, but to the extent that we can monitor and track that to confirm the effectiveness, I think that'll bode well for the city at large and certainly this committee as it looks to achieve various economic development objectives. Um, currently, the EWD's business assistant team is working with the Office of Finance uh, to add subscription capabilities that are expected to be available soon after approval of the items um, presented today. And once the subscription service is available, EWD will coordinate with various city departments to formulate and distribute information bulletins to businesses in Los Angeles. Uh, the department believes that by engaging the business community on a quarterly or semi-annual basis, it will serve as a means to inform businesses of sort of new happenings in the city. It's important that they be engaged, they know what's going on, particularly those new startups, so that they understand the system and maybe even some of the success stories of complementary businesses. And so to the extent that we can create an environment that encourages business, we want to do that. And we think this is a strategy to possibly achieve the same. Uh, with respect to the rapid response officer position, um, EWD is requesting changing the EWD rapid response officer name to EWD business response officer. Uh, the EWD's uh, rapid response program is an existing ongoing program to assist downsizing businesses with staffing support mm. for their employees, particularly on our workforce development side. And so the name change to business response officer will help in marketing the service and assistance the city can provide for small businesses within the city of Los Angeles. Um, and so with that in mind, EWE will also be able to promote the LA business response officer with a dedicated phone number and an email that might read uh, LA business response at lacity.org. Again, these are just ways to make it just more easily identifiable for those in the business community to reach out and figure out what's going on. So as it relates to goal 1B, 
uh, create a new swamp. I, let's let's uh, just stick with 1A for sure. a second, and then we'll move on to that. Um, a, a few things. First of all, what are the challenges that you've had in getting the positions filled, first of all? How can we help address that, um, the fact that half of the positions are vacant? Sure. Actually, if we, we just, with respect to the Assistance Chief Grants Administrator position, which was just recently filled within the past uh, five months or so, for some time it had been a uh, civil service position, and um, relatively recently it was flipped to exempt, and we were able to bring someone on board, and as soon as she came on, um, she got going and starting to establish her team. With respect to the, some of the other vacancies, quite frankly, I think um, within the city family, there are a lot of opportunities, and I think folks are looking for ways just to move up. Mm. And you couple that with the uh, historically low unemployment rate that uh, we're experiencing, private sector, they're having troubles and challenges uh, filling positions, and I don't think the city is too different in that regard. So, uh, but notwithstanding those challenges, you know, we, we filled four of the seven. Um, as I indicated, even one of the, the positions that need to be refilled um, had been filled, and someone had the opportunity to promote. And so on the one hand, it's encouraging, and it's nice to hear that folks are, you know, going up the career path and the career ladder, if you will, but it also poses a challenge for EWD, and I would imagine other departments as well as we sort of deal with the retiring and aging workforce and also trying to engage others uh, to program them into those vacant positions. But I don't think, other than our personnel division continuing to advertise positions, there's much that the council office can do. Um, certainly open to suggestions, but as I sit before you, I mean, we just have to continue to work with our personnel department um, on occasion, maybe soften some of the requirements without compromising, you know, ultimately yep. the work product that's necessary. Okay. It, given the nature of this committee, it's a good problem to have that we are in a robust jobs environment right now and it's tough to recruit. So I, I guess that's the good news. Um, you mentioned planning to report back on uh, some metrics of the number of businesses uh, served and, and so forth. And um, w when we did create the Business Advancement Unit, one of our goals was to um, have reports back on types of businesses, uh, the types of assistance that, that they've been requesting, the number of businesses assisted, how long it takes to resolve their issues, um, and a number of other kinds of metrics. Um, so when would you envision that you'd be prepared to report back with um, with those sorts of statistics so we can evaluate success and opportunities um, and areas where we need to still improve? I think to have an adequate sample um, is probably good to see about 12 months. I think uh, anywhere between 12 to 18 months. We could do something within six months, but you know, I don't know if we would have a, an appropriate sample to give you and the committee pretty good idea about the success of the program. Um, if you insist, we could certainly do it within six months, but my thought is probably within about 12 months or so would be the first first report back with respect to the effectiveness of, of, the, of the system. Well then, in, in terms of increasing that sample size, and that brings me to my next question, uh, which is awareness of the business advancement team. Um, I, I'm, I don't know if council offices are yet aware that we have a business advancement team, and I, what kind of outreach have we been doing to the business community, to the chambers, um, to the council offices, to small business advocacy organizations and others to let them know that this option is now available for them? Yeah. Um, given that we're really just, just launching within the last three to four months, within the next uh, three months or so, I think that we will really formulate a very strategic um, method to, to go out and, and contact those folks in the business communities to let them know what's available to them within the city. Um, certainly working with uh, existing city departments to encourage them, particularly those that are startups that just are getting mm -hmm. their business license, letting them know, um, depending on just how quickly we can engage those folks, including the folks within the city, I think that will, will, will give us a better idea about growing the sample size and doing the effective marketing. But um, you know, on the outside, a year, it, it could very well be a little sooner than that, but I'm typically a bit more conservative than not. Yeah. Yeah, I think really robust outreach and marketing is essential uh, for this 
for the success of this proposal in particular. And in th that regard, the subscription opportunity will be a great tool when it's up and running as well. Oh, and do you have a sense of when we're going to be able to uh, really take advantage of the subscription uh, that, process? That, that should be within within five weeks or so. Uh, okay. Soon after this is adopted, um, we can already, I'm sorry, we're already taking the steps to set it up, but we just sort of need the blessing uh, to move forward. So the subscription um, system in order to, to track things and better engage businesses um, can be done by the end of 18, by the end of May of 18. Very good. All right, the Small Business Commission, 1B. Small Business Commission, um, certainly as you're aware, uh, will serve as an advisory in an advisory capacity, and all actions of the commission um, will be made in the form of an advisory recommendation to the mayor and city council. The duties of the of the, the commission will include, but aren't limited to, reaching out to the small business community to solicit input, feedback, and potential solutions to issues they face with city policies or processes. Um, certainly in holding the meetings to solicit commitment from the small business community, uh, developing an outreach plan for the city to commit, to implement, I should say, um, when city infrastructure or other projects will impact the local small business communities, and assisting the city with outreach to the small business community when new or changed policies or processes will impact the small business community. And this relates back to what we just sort of talked about. This is just another tool or mechanism to, to, to to work with uh, businesses and to help them. Um, the framework for the Small Business Commission is in place and we're hoping to submit the same by May of 18, that's next month, okay. and rolling it out soon thereafter. And so as we talk about sort of the touch reaching the business owners, this is one strategy, one method by which we could do that, certainly in working with the chambers and other resources that are available to help us gather that information, make certain people are aware of the business assistance team so that they know that we are an asset and to be a benefit to them as they expand. Great. So May, uh, next, month, oh, next month, we'll have the work plan as well. Indeed. Okay. Very good. Indeed. All right, and were you going to speak to the asset management system too? Sure, and, and with that, I'll ask Amy Benson of GSD and Jackie Wagner of the CAO to join me. We got plenty of chairs if you need. Uh, <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> okay, so I'm really happy to report that on Strategy 1C, uh, which is the establishment of the asset management framework for the disposition of city-owned properties for economic development, um, that most of your, the short-term objectives have already been met. I want to thank you for your support, your leadership, and uh, continued focus. Um, as a result, we did approve the Economic Workforce um, Economic Development Trust Fund uh, last month, so we appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> over the last few years, the city has taken significant and proactive measures to provide the resources and tools necessary to work on economic development initiatives and objectives defined by the council and mayor. S uh, three such measures include funding and authority to build the city's first ever automated database system to manage our real estate data and portfolio. Uh, number two, the mayor established the Economic Workforce Development Trust uh, Department a couple of years ago. And then um, one of the most significant things this mayor and council did was establish the Asset Management Strategic Planning Unit, which is now known as the Asset Management Group. This is an oversight body that, is, uh, that provides strategic real estate planning and oversight of economic development activities. These actions have catapulted our data management and direct economic development activities into the 21st century, and we thank you for that support. As far as the asset evaluation framework, it was approved in May of 2016, and the uh, City Council took a significant and important step by doing this. This asset evaluation framework is an evaluation tool that provides uniformity, consistency, and a predictability to city departments and the citizens of Los Angeles on the process for requesting reuse, evaluation of such use, and the processing um, of such uh, resulting recommendations. The Asset Evaluation Framework designates a Municipal Facilities Committee, a council-designated body since the 1950s, as a clearinghouse for consideration and approval of a variety of 
uh, real estate related uses. The types of uses, um, continued use for delivery of city projects, uh, city services, nonprofit use, economic development, housing, um, homelessness, and uh, other services. Um, since the adoption of this framework, <clears throat> CAO Asset, the CAO Asset Management Group has met with uh, the assistance of the General Services Real Estate um, Services Division and the Economic Workforce Development Department with council offices and departments to determine and prioritize city properties in each council district with the greatest potential for economic development and other uses. It should be noted that GSD's work is primarily centered around the use of properties for provision of city services and disposition of properties via auction or direct sale for non-economic development purposes. EWDD, however, has assessed and prioritized properties, including proactive outreach uh, activities to council offices specific to economic development <clears throat> and other purposes. Um, EWDD, uh, Sam Hughes, he told me he was already going to be here, so I shouldn't introduce him, but I just want to introduce him again as our counterpart, and, um, and I have Amy Benson here to speak more on the asset management database system. Um, within EWDD, uh, the Real Estate Asset Management Unit consists of uh, three real estate professionals. One is a senior real estate officer, um, a property manager two, and property manager three. Interestingly enough, and harkening back to my earlier comment about promotion and the like, each of the three positions or the individuals came from, one came from Wawa, one came from DWP, and um, another came from Harbor. So this is just further evidence of sort of what's happening within the city in, in terms of promotion and, and, and expanding um, career opportunities. Um, but these three are focused on managing, acquiring, and disposing of city-owned and option real property assets with economic development value. Uh, the, department, the department has focused its efforts on solutions that treat real property as a productive asset, and within the coming weeks, uh, the CAO and EWD will provide its annual report on specific activity concerning real estate projects. So it's very, very targeted, and you'll know exactly what we've been doing and, and how this asset framework is actually working. Um, in support of the objective to treat property as a productive asset, EWDD is analyzing property to determine community need and highest and best use of the asset, and this is done in collaboration with council offices. Uh, we're facilitating the appropriate marketing approach for the asset that may include gathering of information uh, necessary to prepare and release a request for proposal. This also is done in collaboration with the council offices. Uh, we're evaluating responses to requests and recommend the best suited development team that will provide the best economic benefit to the city. Um, and certainly uh, negotiating with developers a plan consistent with spurring sustainable economic development and job creation while working with the city attorney to ensure the economic development purpose for which the asset is conveyed is carried out. And oftentimes that's done through covenant agreements that are recorded against the property that clearly articulate and obligate the developer to do very prescriptive work. And much of that is down into the disposition and development agreement. Um, it's also worth noting that most recently the city attorney prepared and council and the mayor's office approved the economic development trust fund. Uh, the asset management strategic planning evaluation framework uh, commissioned by this committee uh, provides the procedure for conveyance of real property for economic development and other uses. Um, and the plan for the use of the funds deposited in the trust fund will further enable the department to fulfill its purpose of maintaining and creating a sustainable economic projects and programs. And... Um, I, I want to go ahead and have Amy Benson from GSD uh, briefly touch upon the asset management system and in many ways how EWD has used that system. Okay. Amy Benson, Department of General Services. I'm an assistant director for Real Estate Services Division. Yes. I'm also the project manager for the city's asset management system, or also known as the AMS. The AMS is an integrated work management system that has several modules for preventive and create corrective work orders that are generated to maintain the city properties and tracking city assets such as equipment, our leases, space, and of course our city property. The effort to configure the AMS included the property module that was led by an AMS steering and executive committee made up of stakeholder departments and offices including CAO, CLA, Recreation and Parks, EWDD, HSID, DOT, Mayor's Office, 
BOE, LAPD, LAFD, Library, and Cultural Affairs. This collaborative effort ensured that the system would meet the needs not only for our city departments and offices who needed the use who need to use this system and also store information about our city property, but also wanted to ensure that meaningful information is provided for the public. A property database is accessible through LACity.org and includes filtering capabilities for some of our most requested information, such as surplus property, or also filming locations, for example, at city properties. We receive many requests for city property information, which have other economic and job growth implications. We have met with the film industry, for example, to determine what their needs are and to demonstrate how to better use this information and how it would be useful for them. For instance, the film community is interested in knowing more about city property for potential filming location with nearby surplus property, city surplus property, that could be used for base camp. Another consideration is working with departments such as EWDD and CAO to identify and store information uh, store information contemplated for economic development projects. The property module went into production in June of 2017, and along with being, able, being available through the city's website, the property information is also available through Navigate LA, which is also public facing. This fiscal year, the Department of General Services is configuring a new tool that would make it even easier for our constituents to access city property data, including the surplus property. For example, the public can log on to the website that would have a tile, a tile that says surplus property. They can then click on that tile to learn more about the city surplus properties, the process of selling or auctioning city property, or have the option of generating a report listing all of the surplus property in the city or within a particular council district. And then there is a city auction coming, and if there's a city auction coming in the near future, they would then be directed to a link that, could, that would obtain information on how they could participate in that process. Our ongoing collaboration with stakeholder departments will ensure that our database is kept current and important data regarding city property is managed in one centralized location. Well, thank you. And I can't say enough positive things about where we are with this. So first of all, thank you to each of you and your teams uh, for getting us here because this has been a long time coming. And I think every council member has expressed the exact same frustration about not having this tool prior to now. And so it's, um, it's going to be a real game changer, I think, for a lot of things. Um, I'm still um, not entirely clear on how we make the assessment among the differing demands uh, for utilization of uh, our asset management system. Uh, there are conflicting goals that the city has for how best to utilize this, and community need is not necessarily the same as highest and best use. Um, so h how is it that um, we are prioritizing use of a particular property among our need for homeless shelter, permanent supportive housing development, economic development, um, disposition as surplus? How, do, how does the decision-making process go uh, in that regard? <clears throat> okay, it's, uh, you are absolutely right. There are um, multiple demands and, and oftentimes um, I'd say multiple uh, visions for use of the same property. And I think, though, that with the asset evaluation framework and with the MFC as the one clearinghouse um, with everything starting with a motion from the council office, that's helped uh, tremendously over the last year and a half to cut down duplication and to streamline consideration of these properties. Um, I can tell you that with regard to the Affordable Housing Opportunity Sites Initiative, which is managed by um, my group along with um, our counterparts from, uh, from housing, that when we meet with the council offices, it is with the, um, our homeless coordinator who is at the same time talking about um, shelters and navigation sites and storage, along with um, you know, my um, uh, at, um, chief analyst who's working on uh, the permanent supportive housing and the affordable housing component. So uh, you have every entity with regard to the homelessness issue um, meeting with the council office at the same time and determining what's, um, you know, potentially what could be done. 
Um, we are also within the CAO and um, my group meeting with GSD and, um, and oftentimes with the um, EWDD representatives when discussing potential uses um, with regard to economic development and or continued city use. So I, I would say that a lot of the coordination is happening through our CAO's office as I think it was intended. Additionally, how we are actually using the AMS system is that um, every single property has now been entered into that AMS. And so once a motion is initiated, GSD in, in um, maintaining this, uh, the site and the information will flag that particular property. And so any additional other use or conflicting use, that gets, um, there's a tickler file on that and so that gets flagged immediately. Um, I, I'm not going to say that there isn't conflict, there, is, there aren't still some conflicts, but I'd say that's been greatly reduced and that, and that is because we do have this automated system and we do have coordination um, and a central point of contact through um, our office, through the CAO's office. Okay. Terrific. Thank you very much. Again, I, I can't say enough good things. I'm really excited about this. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to 1D, procurement reform. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is John Schwab Goto with General Services. I'm here to talk about the uh, RFP manual, which is the first uh, item under this topic. Uh, we've been working with the city attorney on a revision of the uh, RFP manual for the last many months. Um, that prompted a, uh, a rewrite of the city's uh, standard provisions, which was completed back in October and again led to a, another rewrite of the RFP manual that was completed and reviewed by the Bureau of Contract Administration and the Bureau of Engineering. Uh, we are now in the process of updating several hundreds of pages of attachments and are looking at a way of uh, packaging it in a more cohesive and more concise uh, manner. Um, we anticipate being done with the rewrite in September of 2018, and we will be working with our newly hired CPO on packaging it for the departments. Great. Now, I assume that once those rewrites are done, that's going to require council action to approve because some of those standard procedures were mandate, mandated by council. They were, all, they were all mandated um, and approved by council. I don't know that the RFP manual itself needs to be revisited by council because we're, we're not changing any uh, ordinances or directions from the council. We're just updating the document to reflect previous actions okay. by the council. Okay. So... Uh, reducing the number of words without necessarily the number of mandates then <laughs> we're trying to okay. it's, it's difficult because since the first or the last revision of the of the RP manual there have been new social economic programs that have been introduced by the council and that's what we're trying to to uh, interject for example the, the Iran Contra uh, mandate so we're, we that was something that didn't exas exist when we last had the uh, the RFP updated, RFP manual updated. So we're now introducing that along with many others in, uh, into the manual to, to make it more current. So I'm just going to think out loud with you sure. for a minute without, you know, coming down I, I on, need, a on the side of a decision on this. But I need all the help thinking. Well, I, you know, it, it, there may be merit in considering after you're completed, after you, you've completed that work, um, Putting it before council with a with recommendations for a reconsideration of some of those items that may not may be moot at this point may not be as urgent at at this point as they were when they were enacted um, because when council enacts these sort of mandated requirements for for the bid package there's no check in to determine you know whether that's still a good idea. And this may be the opportunity to do that. I, I will I also say, well, but I will also give you the other side of the argument, which is it may open up a can of worms. And once it's before us, there may be 18 amendments that are introduced for additional things to add. So I want to put it out there as a, you know, a thought suggestion that, you know, we need to consider. But as you get closer to 
completion, maybe we can revisit what the best strategy is for, for moving forward with that. So um, we'll work with the, with the, the city's uh, chief procurement officer and, and take your recommendations into consideration. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Krikorian. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, speak and report back to the committee. Um, and I also want to just thank you for the uh, exposing me, the warm welcome that you've given me, and also exposing me to the comprehensive jobs report, which I think is the exact right approach. And I would also say, when you're thinking about procurement reform, you have to think about it in a very comprehensive way, which is the way that I know we've discussed it and the way that the team here has been thinking about it. Um, and also for the invitation to think through any potential changes through ordinances or changes through the policies that uh, the council may consider. Uh, I'm going to hold you to that, and I, I think we're going to come back with some ideas on that front as well. Um, one of the things that I've noticed since I've been here, as you know, I've, I came from New York City a couple months ago. It's been already a couple months. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that all of the challenges that the stakeholders uh, in, uh, that I've met with um, are, exist. Um, a lot of the vendors have, have talked about how difficult it is to contract with the city, a lot of the compliance uh, requirements, uh, the various federated um, uh, landscape of the way that the departments do business. Um, I also believe, though, that in spite of those challenges, a lot of, the, a lot of good work has been done, is being done, and that actually those challenges represent opportunities for us. Um, and thinking about this in a cohesive uh, manner I think will be very helpful to us. Um, in terms of the recommendations on 1D, the long term, around staff and professional development, the data needs, as well as the, um, the streamlining pieces, I think all of those can be enabled by technology as well as some of the process changes. One of the things that I would counsel to all of us is that we should not be thinking about technology as the panacea. Um, you know, I've heard a lot. I've, I've actually implemented procurement systems in my previous position, and one of the one of the challenges that I've seen in other jurisdictions is that we are taking a piecemeal process. We think about procurement as a piecemeal process and automate one piece of that or another piece of that, and then what ends up happening is that you end up with a process that actually does not help the overall cycle, the life cycle of procurement, and does not actually help the vendor community or the internal city stakeholders. Um, so what I so the thinking that we're bringing to this is a real end-to-end uh, -end overview, thinking through what processes can change. In the short term, we're working on this RFP manual, but in the long term, I would love to be able to have a procurement leadership institute um, as part of our department curricula, as part of uh, so that each department has a person who is trained on the best practices, not of general procurement but also of LA-specific procurement. And that's going to require partnership with the private sector as well as the public sector and the knowledge base here, uh, sourcing all of those, all of those um, uh, practices that we've, we, we know exist, all the people who are doing the great things internally in LA, uh, and, uh, and making sure that that translates to our workforce. Um, also, in terms of data, the data right now exists in multiple repositories. Um, some of it is at the department level, some of it is in FMS, some of it is um, just anecdotal, and all of that needs to be captured in one place. Uh, whether it is a data warehouse where we actually source that information and integrate with other systems, or if it's a procurement platform that collects all this information. And why is that important? Because for stakeholders like the council that has to oversee and approve contracts, we would like to see what. I'm, I'm assuming that you would like to see cycle times. You would like to see vendor information, performance evaluation information. What are the how are the departments doing in terms of our business inclusion practices? All of that information should be housed in one place and reportable. I, I believe that reportable online and to the public as well as our internal stakeholders. That way we can all be accountable to each other and to the public for um, and also share amongst departments. That's the next stage of the open data um, uh, open data movement is how do we actually make this information usable and actionable for the people who are doing the work. And so I look forward to um, your partnership and your support as we come through with specific recommendations on all of these actions. Terrific. Um, when do you think is a good time frame to, to bring you back to do those things? Because well, I, I would actually like to have a meeting this this committee, I think, just to talk about those issues even. So 
what, what's a good time frame to be thinking about? I that? would love to come back to you actually this summer. Um, okay. I think that within the next three months or so, I would have a very solid plan uh, in terms of moving forward. Terrific. Well, your position was one of the objectives of this uh, committee, and so having you here is uh, uh, checking a box of you know an, another accomplishment. We're glad to have you aboard and glad to have you uh, in in this role. So, Thank welcome. Um, great. In, anything else on? Procurement? Yeah. Uh, Ted Ross, general manager with the IT agency. Would the council member like an update on the contract management system work at all? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'll hand it over to David Parker, our project manager. Okay. So after many months of uh, process document documentation and requirements gathering, and actually, if anyone's interested, we have a 10-foot process map up of the construction contract. <laughs> you didn't bring process. it along? <laughs> well, uh, we, can bring it, we can bring one to you if you'd like. Um, so we, we worked very closely, uh, it was the mayor's office, ITA, and a number of the stakeholders to, to focus on, on this process and really document the as-is, what's working well, what isn't working, what's highly manual, what's frustrating, and then put together a plan. We had three approaches. and. We determined that we would take the approach of leveraging the investments that we have, um, but but integrating them into into a full system solution. Uh, and so we're we're excited. We're we want to report back that we are uh, actually on on pace to make our fall uh, go live date, which we had uh, had committed. And um, so there's a number of internal objectives that we had laid out in our response, uh, but which included, you know, improved cycle times, increased efficiencies, uh, actually close to six times return on investment on the actual cost of the project. But I think one of the things, and I think it was especially important for this, for this project, was that we improve the, the process for the contractors. And it really is a highly manual, very stressful process. They're in the hallways, filling things out in paper at the very last minute. And they make mistakes. They make mistakes in addition on their, on their forms. They, make, they forget to sign something. And we found that just the ROI on the non-responsive, sometimes the, the lowest bidder was a million times below the next lowest. And they, weren't, we couldn't, they were found non-responsive because of a simple signature on a form. So we felt that by automating and digitizing this process right off the bat, making it easier for the, the contractors, and making it so that that can't happen, we have three prompts now that we're, we've designed into this next iteration for, for uh, the fall where it will tell them you didn't fully complete this right inside the form and then right inside before they submit the entire application, the entire response will say, you didn't complete this form, please go complete this form. Um, so there's three times, three checks. And so we really were designing it with, with, with them in mind and we have a whole laundry list of improvements we have for you know our next iterations, but we think this is really going to move the needle forward um, uh, a lot, and uh, so we're really excited. And um, we've had great, great uh, participation by by the stakeholders. In fact, the Bureau of Engineering wants to start using the aspects of the system that are ready now before the go live date, which will actually be really helpful to us because we can do all that, uh, limit the risk at go live because we'll already have our users in in that portion. Uh, using it uh, uh, in the next few weeks, so I'm really excited to hear that because you know with with larger contracts, a lot of times it seems like we don't get enough responsive bidders to really be able to call it competitive bidding with a straight face. Right. Um, with smaller contracts, where we have many small businesses here locally that could benefit from a procurement relationship with the city. Um, you know, they make simple mistakes, like you say, and are, and are out of the running. And um, to be able to have those checks in place so that that doesn't happen is going to be extremely important in saving money for the budget and also making sure that we can create more business here locally. So, Make more of our small businesses medium businesses. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's terrific. Um, and I'm glad to hear you're on pace. For, so we'll check back in uh, around fall. All right. Anything else, Mr. Ross? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that will bring us then to improvements to the local business pref pre preference program, 1E. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, Hannah Choi, um, Assistant Director at the Bureau of Contract Administration. Um, so BCA was tasked with actually certifying our local businesses rather than accepting their uh, affidavit. And as a result, um, we had a, a backlog of, um, a, quite a backlog, and it took 149 days. But last year, during the budget, you um, granted us a position. And um, along with that position, LAWA stepped up and because of their LAMP program, also added another position. And so the backlog, the average of 149 days, uh, was reduced to 18 days. Wow. So effectively, we have no backlog. Anybody who wants to be certified as an LBE can now get pretty quick service. So very pleased to um, report that. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing our fiscal year 1617 annual report, which will show how many awards went to local businesses, how many awards went to local businesses as a result of the local preference program, uh, how, how much dollars uh, fell under the local business program, and um, how many uh, businesses are impacted. So that will be uploaded pretty soon. Within a few weeks, we will um, report. Uh, but just based on what we have now, just for your interest, we have currently uh, 412 awards that went to LBEs, totaling $858 million. And that rep represents 14.84%, so which is not bad. And then uh, the, LBP, the LBE awards due to the program, there were 27 awards at $195 million, <laughs> representing 3.38%. And then, you know, there's a cost to the city if the preference program is used. And so uh, the city spent a little over $5 million, uh, which is 0.09% of the total spend. So, Pretty, uh, pretty effective. Um, then uh, another uh, exciting report is that BCA partnered with EWDD. We uh, had every um, business source center come and train with us for a month, uh, for four-week training. Uh, they actually took a final exam and became certified as a certification intake specialist, which means that these employees at the business or centers can now assist with businesses who want to get certified, mm -hmm. help them through, which saves us time. Sure. And so when uh, we receive complete packages from the applicant, we're able to expedite their certification. So that's something effective that we've done. So good, good things happening. Very good. So uh, the completed report should be available for us by the end of May then? Yes. Okay. Of course, definitely. And um, when we take that up, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure when that will be, but when we do take it up, um, we'll probably want to have a, a pretty thorough discussion about what alterations and policy changes would be most effective in making those numbers even more robust. Right. So um, whether it's outreach, whether it's changes in the formula, whether it's changes in the nature of the local business that would be certified. Um, those are, I think, are all things that we're going to want to have a look at to improve the performance even more. Most definitely. The other thing I'd like to ask of you is um, the county has a social enterprise preference program, yes. which um, helps to give a, a bidding advantage to local businesses that are also serving social enterprise purposes, getting homeless people employed and off the street, for example, or formerly incarcerated folks. Right. And, that. and um, I'd like to at least explore whether that kind of a preference is, um, is in order for the city as well. And so if you could, when you report back, mm -hmm. also report back on the, um, the nature of the county's program and any benefits that there uh, may be to the city in creating a similar program. We'll do that. Thank you. And Mr. Bloomfield, we're moving on to uh, recommendation 1F now on item number two. So that's uh, development services reform and permitting efficiencies.
Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon, Tom Rothman, Principal Planner with the Planning Department. I'm Charlie Rausch, Interim Chief Zoning Administrator for the Planning Department. I'm also the manager of the Citywide Projects Division, which includes major projects, environmental impact reports, and the expedited processing section. And I'm Aldo Bao, uh, Building Civil Engineer with uh, Building and Safety. I'm Karen Panera with Building and Safety. And, um... Who wants to start? <laughs> um, I, I'll start from the planning department, Tom Rothman. Um, we're, we're on item 1F. 1F, yes. So the first item of the uh, short-term objectives and the next steps was to continue the implementation of a one project, one planner approach, and we, are, we have done that. We have reorganized our department into a cross-functional geo team type of system where, um, where applicants can go just to their geography, to their geo team to get all of the services as opposed to breaking into different entitlement sections. So before we were primarily set up as a subdivisions or as a office of zoning administration. So you kind of had to need, know where to go. Right now we are, for the most part, well, actually with the exception of Charlie who oversees major projects, are a sort of a one-stop shop for entitlement. So you go to your geography and you can find out who the planner is and all of the entitlements related to your project are with that planner. And then if I can add for major projects, uh, which are, can be anything from a single family home with an environmental impact report, which is forced upon us by the courts to 50 million square feet of development, uh, we also do one project, one planner, so the person who was assigned to do the environmental impact report also works on the follow-up entitlement for that case. And what that has done is it's because the uh, planner is has done the project all the way through as they are doing their environmental impact report, they can also start writing the environmental findings, which speeds up the process because from personal experience, it's about 100 hours minimum to do your environmental findings, and that's just the findings by themselves. And just to conclude, item one is that in February of this year, we did institute a new comprehensive staff cross-training just to accommodate this because it is such a, a very uh, diverse type of a uh, group of projects before we were very highly specialized now we're geographically based so because there we need to have all of our planners essentially know all of our entitlement process we've uh, initiated a very intensive cross training across the department so that we get the best of the best training everybody so it's sort of to help even everything out okay very good building and safety we are um we're here to talk about item 1FA, which is on the CLA report, is page 17, and it's um, the topic is Build LA. Yeah. So <clears throat> Build LA was a has been a long time project, and after a lot of evaluation and inclusion of other development services departments, as we indicated in our response, it was evident that we couldn't do a big bang where we basically would have to shut down development services across the city to implement a new system. Not only that, it would be very expensive and problematic to do that. And that's what it came down to. So we decided to go ahead with the overarching goals of creating a development services portal. We're currently working on it with uh, other development services departments <clears throat> and to provide transparency, a single point of entry to um, people that want development services, uh, and customer dashboard, registration, project ID, those things are still intact. It's just that it's not going to replace everybody's system with a one-size-fits-all solution. Currently, we're holding regular meetings with uh, planning, fire, um, and Bureau of Engineering on developing the portal. We're a few weeks away from doing a, a trial launch of that portal so that our customers can give us some feedback on how they like the navigation and then uh, and then we can it'll be up and running after after that 
we continue, we'll continue to work on the portal and make this, the services more robust. Whatever's online now in Bureau of Engineering or planning, building a safety fire, will be online at the moment that the portal is open up. As more online services become available, then they'll also be a part of the portal. Um, <clears throat> it's been a very challenging project, but thankfully the city departments have worked very well with building and safety, and we really appreciate their help and their input because we know it was a lot to ask of them to, to take this journey <clears throat> with us. Um, do you have any questions about Build LA? Well, um, just so I understand, if, if Build LA as a standalone is not going to move forward, but there is going to be an online portal to integrate these things, is, is the information that's present on the other development services websites all going to be accessible through the portal? That's correct. So there, this isn't going to be a situation where we're adding yet another site that people have to visit and then go and visit the other sites as, no. as well? Um, I, I didn't bring it with me, but if you'd like to see a mock-up of the portal, I can certainly give you a copy of what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> we don't have wizards yet, but there will be wizards so that you can simply say, sort of like, well, I guess we're not supposed to name names, but Alexa, you know, this is what I want to do, and then <clears throat> the system will eventually um, navigate you to the service you want. Now it is a keyword search. You can see all the services by department, all the services alphabetically, or you can go to the individual collection of services, building a safety fire, planning, and Bureau of Engineering. And um, it's, a, it's a, pretty, a pretty nice uh, launch. If, if you would like, uh, council member, I can certainly send you the information so you can I'd take a look at definitely it. Definitely like to And see when that, we yeah. do the soft launch too, we can send you the address of it so that you can click on it and see how you like it. Give us Great. feedback. Uh, um, and uh, one size fits all was not working because there were a lot of systems that the departments had in place that they did not want to relinquish, which made it problematic to try to fit all those pieces together with a new sort of core system. But the portal delivers to the customers one entry point and uh, a dashboard that will let you look at your project across department lines. And that was important to, I think, all the policymakers. Okay, well, hopefully we'll achieve much of the same uh, desired result with, you know, not quite as much drama and difficulty. So <laughs> we'll keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Mr. Bloomfield? You know, uh, catching up here, but I mean, it sounds it sounds great. But where, what's what's going to be the barrier to that kind of uh, synchronicity between? I mean, you know, because you have the one portal, everybody goes in, but but you're still seems like there's still different systems. It, but that's the beauty of it. We have those systems connect to the portal rather than replacing all of the systems and make them fit into the same pigeonhole because that was becoming an impossible task. But, but is there some lack of interoperability between them? No, they're just systems that have been built over decades on different platforms and they operate differently. But the portal doesn't care. The portal, if you want to the apply... kind of a skin that gets you to the different doors. But it's not... But I guess what I'm questioning is, is can you move the data back and forth? The data... I'm not exactly sure what you mean. There's a customer registration piece where you register for the portal. Then, yeah, then if you uh, want to go to sit, this is our city planning buddy. Um, and if you want to uh, apply for an entitlement or you want to apply for a B permit in Bureau of Engineering or a building permit in Building and Safety, that customer registration information is used every place you go. So you don't have to retype your information. In terms of status data, the status is collected by the Build LA portal and displayed to whoever wants to, to look at it. Um, sure. Good morning. Uh, afternoon, Councilman. Robert Duenas, Acting Principal, Development Services. I've been working with um, Build LA and Karen for a long time, and I'm 
kind of like the technical geeky portion of it that interfaces with planning. The question you raised about how does everyone communicate with everyone, we've got tons of legacy systems, right. different structures of databases, um, currently operating systems conflict. That's what I'm worried about, right. Right, oh, no. Wait, trust me, that's what kind of brought us down. Um, one of the key features with the portal and the entire system is projects will come in with a universal ID. So if you are Staples Center, you will be given a universal ID and all the departments will use that ID to identify your project, your status. So the underlying data will always be key to that universal ID and that's how other departments can share information without actually transferring information physically. You can just visually see it and it'll all be, have that key feature. Um, but that was definitely one of the questions we all had. Uh, some people are operating on dinosaur services. In the future, one of the lofty goals is to create a data warehouse where we actually do have more synergy on the data and we do draw from the same repository. We're not there yet, but planning will maintain their systems and their data, building a safety BOE, but the Build LA portal serves them up to you with one request so that you know about your project. Project ID is one way, an address is another way, a project name is another way to bring the stuff from these disparate systems to you as the, the consumer. And then maybe you'll see if there's conflict. I mean, ideally, if the data is all being shared, then the conflicts kind of go away. But at least this way, you'll see everything. And if, if one department has something that's different factually than another, you can bring that to the surface, I guess. Right. But. We have a we have a lot. Uh, for future rollouts, but th that's another consideration is you don't want to plan and plan and plan and then freeze yourself so you never really roll anything out. So this, this is a collective um, project and like I say, we really appreciate everybody coming together like Bob and, and Bureau of Engineering and, and FIRE to make it happen. Thank you. There's okay. another piece yeah. in here about universal. I was testing. just going to ask you that. So. <laughs> that's that. I wanted to know if you want to hear about yeah, that. Yeah, That's also what, one that I. I'm where are we, and when will it be available for use? Excuse me. When when do we expect that that will be available for use? Um, it's a nine to ten months. We started um, the project uh, February first, so we signed the contract on January thirtieth. We've had. Um, uh, several planning sessions. We have a lot of different meetings going on almost daily. There's project meetings and there's status meetings, um, and we're moving along. We're <clears throat> uh, going to roll it out with all of the services that we provide now that building and safety provides in terms of cash sharing, but we're also building it with in, in mind <coughs> that Bureau of Engineering will eventually want to use the cash sharing system. We collect for them now and we collect some for planning as well and fire. So we'll still collect that. Um, phase two will expand it to other services that we'll collect for in, throughout the development services. Okay. Um, how, uh, how do we stand on the partnership plans between DBS and planning uh, and HCID and LAD, DOT? Um, well, most of them are they're all working pretty well. Um, there is a few left, more of the long-term um, enhancements, um, but everything is going pretty well. We're also working on um, some final steps in establishing a four-way <coughs> partnership, it, uh, a four-way partnership between BOE, yeah. Building and Safety, LADOT, and um, DWP. Okay. So when would you anticipate? Dates. What, yeah, um, what, what's the progress on that? Well, uh, that's kind of hard to say because some of them are dependent on staffing. Um, but for the most part, the majority of the items that have been met, we're just looking at the long-term items. Okay. Okay. So the partnership plans between DBS and Planning, HCID and LADOT um, were anticipated to have been done about two years ago. So right. w where are we with that? I, I just wanted to add that on a monthly basis, uh, we, Department of City Planning and Building and Safety, get together and we, we're continually 
going through each of the issues on there. A lot of them have been resolved. Some of them are going to be ongoing because they're just things that are just coordination between the departments. They're not a finite, this is the end of, of whatever it is. It's like I meet with the chief zoning engineer building and safety on a weekly basis and go over problems. I mean, that's something that we were going to be going onward for a long period of time. So some of these things are not finite when you're looking at a cooperation plan. Yeah, um, but I also, uh, you know, uh, practices among individuals is different than having an approved plan between departments. So, because people move and personalities change and relationships change. So some I, of us retire. Yeah, and some of you unfortunately have to retire at some point. So, yeah, exactly. So that's, I think that's why the uh, partnership plans are, you know, important so that they survive changes in personnel and those relationships. And Councilman, can I expand? Sure. As uh, the acting principal at DSC Development Services Center, we're all at Figueroa now. We've got the fourth floor, the fifth floor, the 10th floor. Um, other agencies are moving in there. That partnership plan and those points that are identified in that, we discuss those at our regular staff meetings among my staff, lower staff, and we make it a point to emphasize communication between the various departments. Having building and safety and planning on the same floor, one floor away, and now other agencies moving there. Uh, just day to day, you run into people in the hallway, you talk to them more often, you do develop those relationships, and yes, people move, but everyone else is creating this bond. Mm. And honestly, the discussions that happen on projects, just serendipitously, is amazing. And the culture's changing, and that's the harder thing to change, is the culture, the attitude that this is not a, this is my job attitude, this is a, we are all one development team. Yeah, for sure, and co-location is, you know, always kind of a, not always, but it's often a, a good step in breaking those silos down yeah. and um, and having that serendipitous stuff. But again, I totally the, agree the next that. step yeah. is making it institutionalized and not True. you know serendipitous. So, um, and, and speaking of, of partnership plans, do does either DBS or or planning have a partnership plan in place, or has there been a discussion yet about having a partnership plan in place with uh, the business advancement unit? Yeah, and and we will get back to you, Council Member. We understand your point is to codify, you know, the agreement so there's it it makes it more uh, permanent and 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 we'll get back with uh, after we talk internally about realistic dates for this to happen because we really understand what you're saying. Great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. E plan, uh, how? What's the status now? We were, I think we were anticipating a launch by end of last calendar year initially, but um, uh, where are we with, with ePlan? And do... I think ePlan is us. Um, oh. Yeah. <clears throat> ePlan, um, we were trying to get a pre-launch. Our launch, our commitment in writing was June of this year. And so, but then... Okay. Verbally, we said, okay, we'll try it by last November. Some things have changed or some priorities have um, changed in the department in terms of getting a pre-launch. We're still working on it. We're trying to isolate a, um, a test version of it so that it only is contained in building and safety so we can test the workflows and the intake and the payment, which is the payment component is tied to universal cash sharing, which is unlike other departments, we charge the plan check fee up front before we accept the plans. So, so we're um, still working on that part. But planning is um, going to um, work with the same vendor that we have worked with. Um, I just traded emails about that this afternoon. and. Fire and BOE are also working with that vendor to create workflows for their work, their e-plan. The um, Bureau of Engineering already is using e-plan. They just don't have the workflow back end, which is what, um, what they're going to work on with our vendor. Um, and Fire is going to develop something new, and planning is going to develop something new. 
So for us, we still plan to launch something by June. Okay. We just don't know exactly. Right now, it looks like tenant improvements that don't require other departmental sign-offs. Uh, and then we'll roll it out. Because once we take in plans that require departmental sign-offs, now they have to also be engaged in that process and have the same tools we have. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's what we need to uh, make sure happens smoothly. Okay, great. Uh, last thing for me before I turn it over to Mr. Bloomfield. Uh, Recode LA, um, are we still on track to meet the five-year work plan goals? And um, in particular, will it be ready to be incorporated into the updated community plans as we go through that process? Tom Rothman, Planning Department. Yes, we are on track with Recode. Uh, it is already being used to update three uh, three of our community plans going through Central City, Central City North, and Boyle Heights, and is also um, being used for the three Southwest Valley community plans. So that's really six community plans using this whole new system. The whole new system has not been adopted yet. Those new zones are going to come along with the community plans. Mm -hmm. What you'll see first, uh, well, this summer we're bringing all of our processes and procedures of the code to the City Planning Commission. So right now our code uh, is embedded with about 114 separate entitlements. All of those things, the adjustments, the track maps, the conditional use permits, uh, there's 114 in the code. We are streamlining, condensing it to about 50 with one section of our new code to handle all of them so you don't have to sort of hunt around for where they all are. We've already uh, pretty much finalized our web-based code to give you your proper zoning that will that will pull out the relevant information for you. Right now there is no new zones on the ground, so it's not up and running, but the, the shell of it has been created. Uh, we're working to have a, a beta test ready in September for the three community plans that will have their EIRs released. So any other great. questions? No, that's great. Thank you. Mr. Just, Blumenfield? Just to follow up on that. So how is that working for the Southwest Valley plans that don't have, that are just getting started here? Well, the Southwest Valley plans were mo the most recent adopted plans. They still have the old zoning system. Um, they will maintain that system. We'll either have to wait for a, for their next... They're still going through the community. Correct, but they still have used, they, they have used the old, the current zone system. So, so for the what we're hoping to do with these later on, once they're adopted and decided upon, have a maybe a very light update so that it doesn't go to the extent, extent that has been done through the process recently, just to give them a conversion zone, something very, very similar, so that they are able to access the new web system. Not to do a whole rezoning, but to basically give them... Updating this summer, right? Correct, right, but they've, yes. So how, what, what will the communities have access to this summer when they're doing those updates? When they, when those community plans are finished, they will not have access to the Recode web system because they have been using this current system, which has not, which has not been, our system has not been built to interpret the old zones, just the new zones. And um, until we rezone them again, give them new names, they'll still have to use the current zoning code, the big blue book. So there will be a time where we have two zoning systems in place as we, as we, we can't just, uh, have a unveiling of a new code with all new zones because we have to rezone the whole city. So it's going to be a period of two systems. Unfortunately, I'm for, unfortunately, I'm worried for what's happening in the Southwest Valley if we hear about the different options, but not being able to take advantage of them necessarily um, as we update. Right. I mean, they do have fairly in. No, saying South LA won't have access to recode. Right. Southwest Valley is uh, getting access to the new system. The, the South LA will not have access to it, but they do have a very well-established community plan implementation system. They, they being, who, I was, at, I was asking about the Southwest Valley. The South, oh, the Southwest Valley, I'm sorry if I misunderstood, does have access, and we are working with the teams to use the new system, the new frontages, the new so form the, districts, the, we'll the recode. We'll have the, the new system. Folks to use. The Southwest Valley, yes. I'm sorry, yes. I thought you said South LA. Anything else on development services? Okay. Very good. Thank you very much.
Um, next step is 1G, hiring new employees for the city, training and apprenticeships. If I can ask personnel to come on up. There's kind of a lot within this, um, so I think I can kind of circumvent a lot of it and, and get straight to my point, which is target, targeted local hire. So if you could speak to um, where we are on progress that we've made in hiring under the targeted local hire, pro hire program, and what steps are we taking to ensure that the people who are being brought in are retained and, and remain on career track. Um, and you're free to tell me anything else you'd like to about <laughs> these, but but that's that's really at, at least what I wanted to focus in on on this. Sure, um, Esther Chang with the personnel department. Um, currently, so f our program has now been operational for approximately a little over a year. We have 253 candidates hired through our program um, through March 31st by 27 of our city departments and offices, um, and we expect our hiring to continue on. Um, in terms of we have recently added on an additional classification to add additional opportunities under our program. Currently, we have six entry-level classifications that can be utilized to hire into. Um, the newest one we're adding is the animal care technician uh, job pathway. So they'll come in as a vocational worker, um, transition to animal care assistant, and then eventually tran uh, transition to animal care tech. Um, and we are also exploring other classifications to see if they would fit within the framework of our program. Is gardener caretaker included yet? It has been, yes. Okay, so yeah, the main six ones that we have been working with is of course the office trainee, which leads into administrative clerk. And the other five pathways are through vocational worker, which would eventually transition to gardener caretaker, custodian, assistant tree surgeon, garage attendant, and and maintenance laborer. Okay. Um, and then in terms of what we're doing to uh, retain our candidates, um, we are continually working with our um, HR offices to maintain communications. Um, during the first six months of our program, the supervisors do fill out a program status update, so at the second and fifth months to monitor um, the progress that they're making to ensure that they're learning the competencies that they're expected to know for the next portion of their transition. Um, at this point, we have had only a small number of the terminations, um, which are only eight of the 253. Eight mm -hmm. out of 253? Yes. That's great, actually. I think so, yes. <laughs> it's actually lower than compared to the sole source class. Sure it is. Yeah, that's, that's very good. Mr. Blumenfield? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. That brings us to 1H, the Citywide Economic Development Strategy. Kind of saving the best for last, Ms. Perry. <laughs> um, my name is Jan Perry, and I'm the general manager of the Economic and Workforce Development Department, and uh, we are seeing the uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel on the preparation of the Citywide Economic Development Strategy. Uh, we've undertaken a very ambitious outreach program uh, throughout the city um, to neighborhood councils, to business improvement districts, uh, to uh, um, chambers of commerce. Uh, we've tried to be diverse comprehensive uh, and to keep a special eye particularly on those neighborhoods that we said we would highlight neighborhoods that historically had been under resourced. Um, from a, uh, a substantive standpoint uh, you can look forward to a, a an implementation plan that is well thought out uh, over the course of five years. Uh, you will find a number of financing tools that uh, you'll be able to work with and, uh, and encourage uh, those who want to bring more development to the city uh, to be able to avail themselves of uh, not only city tools, but state federal tools and some private sector uh, recommendations. Um, I did have the uh, fortune, good fortune, to be able to brief you and your staff last week, um, and uh, we indicated a timeline to you. Uh, it seems that there may be some slight adjustments 
but I think it may end up being six in one hand, half dozen in the other, uh, because in the end, uh, when you're ready to hear the item in your committee, which you indicated uh, would be after the budget right. season, uh, that's when we will hear it. So Great. whenever it gets transmitted. It'll be ready to go. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, well, again, this is another one of those things that's been a really long time in coming, and yeah. I think now that it's here, it's uh, it's going to be very impactful. So uh, thank you, Ms. Perry. Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. Um, I see that the, the, the strategies are going to be completed in May and finalized in June, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem like a lot of time for, for vetting, um, especially when we're all focused, a lot of us are focused very heavily on the budget process. Mm -hmm. So how, how is it going to be vetted with stakeholders and with elected officials um, and, and others? Well, what we intended to do and still intend to do um, is to, we have an in-house working group of all the major departments so that they can review the plan and give their input so we can include that in uh, the final, final draft. Uh, we had hoped to take it out to general community for uh, any further reaction and put it up online so we can get any additional input uh, that one wants to give and then go through the committee process, which is why we met with uh, uh, Councilman Krikorian and Councilman uh, Kern Price, uh, the chair of ED, uh, to discuss timeline for allowing them to take it through their committees and have time to get reaction back and to incorporate that before it's actually published in final form. Um, so, you know, if you'd like to give some input on the timeline, uh, we'd be more than happy to uh, accommodate that. Yeah, I just want to make sure we have the, the opportunity to, I mean, the, the, this is really important stuff that we get yeah. the, the opportunity for us to weigh in and to get some of the I agree. Uh, stakeholders out there. And, and, yeah. And that, one of my particular interests is number is 1H, you know, mm -hmm. having to do with the subventions and the tax yes. issue. Um, you know, it's, it's a valuable tool, but also has a, a lot of potential drawbacks. And I, I, for a long time, I wanted to see a real comprehensive study of, mm -hmm. of that and for us to put in place a system that's equitable and transparent um, as far as that goes and mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to we're that. we're being very cautious we're trying very hard not to slap dash or rush through this because the expectations are very very high um, and so we do want a thorough and uh, three levels deep vetting, even deeper than that, uh, so that, uh, you know, this document will be able to withstand review and uh, uh, actually be a useful tool for those who use it. Um, so I will, uh, you know, incorporate your comments and take it back to the consultants and uh, maybe you can have one of your staff contact me and give me a, a more detailed sense of um, how that extends our trajectory. And, uh, you know. Great. We'll, 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 I'll, my, we'll work with you and your team. And, uh, Great. And, and likewise, the report that comes out of the ad hoc um, would, I mean, we can hold that an adequate amount of time before it's considered for council after it's heard here and in ED mm -hmm. to um, allow for plenty of time to get community input as well in, in all of our communities as well. Um, and input from the from the chambers and the business community, from neighborhood councils, and mm -hmm. so on. Great. Thank you. Um, for the next one, too. Well, you know, uh, with regard to uh, the next one, mostly dealt with the subscription yeah. capability. That was one of my concerns, but I think we've already uh, addressed that. But if you want to give a few comments on marketing, city services, and incentives generally, let's do that, and yeah. then uh, I, I think we can really move on. Yeah, I think make it really short, uh, very, very short. Uh, well, we can give you a report with uh, um, analytics in it, uh, not only from our department, um, but in, in interfacing with the other departments from the social media platforms that we use, uh, so that you can so you can see growth, uh, you know, and pick a benchmark and then move it forward, so that you can see how much actually we've really <coughs> grown enormously. And in, in interfacing with the other departments, it's only helped us all grow even more. Um, so I can give you that uh, next next meeting. It wouldn't take Great. much because it's just a just a spreadsheet. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
So, Holly, you've been waiting patiently, but you know what? In, unless, Mr. Bloomfield, do you have questions about business improvement districts? And are... I'm okay to move forward. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's always good to see you. So, um, and uh, likewise, with regard to Kriyas and Jedi zones, I think, you know, we know what we need to know at, at this point on the status there, unless you want to launch into those discussions. So, um, anything else? Oh, yeah, no, oh, that, that, I didn't know that we even really needed to do that, but we did have the discussion about the name change of the position earlier from rapid response officer to business response officer. I think that's a terrific suggestion uh, and shows the right kind of marketing that we're looking for. So um, unless there's any objection to doing so, Mr. Blumenfield will include that as one of our uh, instructions. All right, um, so then I think we're just, uh, we, we have now received uh, that report and we can move on to item number one. Uh, Mr. Chair, pardon me. Yep. Uh, the action on this item is to... Um, I, I think we've received it, so we will now note and file it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Tom Rothman again, Planning Department, and I'm joined with the rest of the team from Planning. Uh, we, were, we are reporting back from a motion introduced uh, late last year on the creation of a more streamlined conditional use permit for the approval of alcohol establishments. Um, and we believe we came up with a really good set of parameters that could help certain types of businesses get through our process a little uh, more expeditiously and a little less costly. I'm going to turn it over maybe to Deborah. She can go through the details of what we are proposing, and uh, we're here to answer any questions. Great. Good afternoon, Hi. Councilman Deborah Cahan, City Planner with Planning. Um, as you are aware, oh, I'd like to give you an overview of our recommendations. So as you are aware, any business currently seeking to sell alcohol must pursue a conditional use permit, or through acronym, we, can, we call this a CUB. Uh, and this applies whether it's a large entertainment venue with dancing or live music or a small local restaurant that's, that you may find at your local commercial corner. Although the conditional use permit process is beneficial in evaluating these larger scale projects, it often proves time consuming and costly for these less intensive businesses and without commensurate benefits to the neighborhood as we see that the same conditions are, are often applied over and over again. So this CUB entitlement process can take approximately six months, costs approximately $12,500 plus associated soft costs. The case is subject to public hearings, an environmental review, and is appealable. Thus, the department recommends that restaurants, theaters, hotels, small business manufacturers, and operations with on-site tastings that meet a standard set of conditions be eligible for an administrative permit. This permit can be processed in two weeks and costs less than $3,000. It is not subject to CEQA review, public hearings, or appeals. The businesses would sign a covenant binding the land to approximately 31 conditions, as we've proposed. But the chief um, standards that you would find in there are the following. No dancing would be allowed, no live entertainment, no karaoke, no hookah service, no solely off-site sales. There's limited outdoor dining. Uh, there is operation... Operation must be maintained between the hours of 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. There is operation of a full kitchen during all business operating hours. Businesses are limited to only one operator and a single ABC license. That is to mean that we're looking at sole proprietors. We're not looking at food courts or, or food halls, which may have a, a larger cumulative impact than just one business. And any change in operator or license type would require a new permit. A review of CUB cases filed in November and December of 2017 revealed that 18% of projects would have qualified for this proposed permit. 
and up to 35% could have qualified with minor adjustments, for example, a change in one or two hours opening or closing time. Neighborhood protection would be maintained through our existing enforcement channels. Your entitlement process or your permit process does not impact the way that we normally enforce your project or your conditions. Uh, businesses would be subject to the department's monitoring ver verification inspection program, known as MVIP. Repeat offenders would be subject to the citywide nuisance abatement program, or CNAP. And uh, of course, state ABC maintains authority to suspend and revoke alcohol licenses the way they do today. Projects not eligible would continue to be reviewed by the zoning administrator through this CUB process. And I'm happy to expand on any of these points or take any questions. Thank you. Mr. Bloomfield? Yeah, a number of questions. Um, first, what's the next step to moving this forward? The next step would be, uh, I believe this is looking to be itemized at, um, on a PLUM agenda. And after being heard at PLUM, we could take this back and um, conduct uh, a proposed, create a proposed ordinance conduct our staff hearing, move forward to the City Planning Commission, and take it through all the legislative process um, uh, steps to become, have this become a fully adopted ordinance by council. Have to go through planning? Yes. And all that. Okay. Yes. It is an amendment to the zoning code. And then a couple of things. It seems to make sense for beer and wine licenses and bona fide restaurants, but I have questions of some of the over-the-counter stuff for other type of applications. So are we proposing uh, administrative approvals for a full line of alcohol? Yes. And I guess if a restaurant with a full line, you know, the concern is that it morphs into a bar or something, you know, where you have, we've all seen places that are called restaurants that it's kind of a fig leaf of a restaurant. Um, does that matter? I mean, you're going to have daytime drinking uh, on the weekends. Robert Dwayne is acting principal for development services. Um, I'm in charge of the BEST program, which reviews the applications for current conditional use permits, restaurants, retail, whatever. Um, we used to oversee also the case processing portion of it. We've since moved that to City Hall for expanded processing cap capacity. But I still take in the cases, review the cases. We clear the conditions. A lot of involvement in the community hearing process. We hear what people say. When this idea first came across our, on the, as a motion, over-the-counter alcohol sales, um, the big question was, well, who should be able to be allowed to participate? Um, we looked at it after our experience of what, is, what are the problems with alcohol sales. Consumption of alcohol isn't the issue. It's always been the operation. So we looked at it from the operation standpoint. What are the operational aspects of this that always create red flags? And if they always create red flags, Maybe they should stay in the conditional use hearing process. And Deborah expanded on those. When you have dancing, it's a club. If somebody has dancing, those do morph into nightclubs. So those should go through that conditional use process if that's what you want up front. If you have live entertainment, um, if you have outdoor dining, those are the type of operation characteristics that do create problems. And the community wants to hear about it. They want to participate and talk about it. But if you took those elements out, you can have such a business that it's just mom and pop serving food in a strip mall and they want to have beer and wine with their food. A small Italian restaurant. And gin and tonics. And well, the thing is, we've, we've, we've had this conversation just among ourselves. Is it, if you're having that small meal, gin and tonic or beer and wine, you can get impacted by either one, depending on how you consume. But the reason you're going to get impacted, it's the operation. Are they going to overserve you? You still have to know how to serve a customer, whether it's a beer or gin and tonic. And that's the training, the star training that they have to go through. These people would have to go through star training with their employees. It's a requirement. Um, so again, it wasn't so much the type of alcohol. It's the operation we're trying to address. Closing at 11. We picked those hours because currently we have over-the-counter commercial corners that are signed off over-the-counter. We went through extensive hearings with those, and citywide, they accepted closure at 11 o'clock, I think it is. Across the board, citywide, if your commercial corner closes at 11 o'clock, it's over-the-counter approval. If this restaurant can abide by that, they're also over-the-counter, because again, it's just the operation closing at the same time a retailer would close. 
Um, that's the approach we took, and we're, we're hoping that allows more people to participate. And to give you an example, if you were a Chipotle restaurant and you want to locate in a large shopping center in the middle of a parking lot, you're a large business, you're a large restaurant, but how many complaints, police complaints do we get for Chipotle? They're a responsible operator. They're a franchisee or a large corporation. They do take great lengths to control how that alcohol is operated and served. We don't have a lot of complaints. So size isn't really the issue. If you're on Ventura Boulevard, um, abutting R1, and you take over a small little retail store that has a patio in the back, that small little restaurant could have a significant impact to the neighborhood in the back. And that's, again, why we said outdoor dining, um, when it abuts R1, should really go through the review process for transparency purposes. And speaking of outdoor dining, what is the limited outdoor dining? Is it a fixed number or percentage of seating? Right, what was the recommendation? Uh, outdoor dining would be allowed if there was no agricultural or residential zones abutting the business. And that includes extending property lines across an alleyway. So if there's no adjacency to an agricultural or residential zone, then outdoor dining is permitted. There's, as we have it today, there's no limitations. Is it just the... The, the building site or the, um, does it have to abut the lot, the A or? Abut the lot. It has to abut the lot. Um, okay, and, so, and do we care if there's no, what about if there's no alcohol service at the outdoor tables? Do we care or does it, is it? We considered that and uh, our thought was that that may be difficult to enforce. It may be something that becomes slippery. And also with the outdoor dining, you're serving alcohol in the building. The problem when you abut R1 and you have an outdoor dining area, the people are, can't consume the alcohol in the, the restaurant, then go out to the patio, have their meal there. Uh, as some people on our staff say, well, now they've had a few drinks, their voices get a little loud. It carries across into the R1, so you're going to have an impact. So that's why we were pretty hard on the outdoor dining. Okay. Um, a couple of, so you mentioned live performances. So... And there's th you're allowed to do this in theaters, right? But what about mo movie theaters or live performance? If the latter, if we're going to do live performances, then we have to... Th this is for restaurants only. Um, theaters. theaters also? But, but not live theaters. Not. So it, it's not for entertainment venues, movie but movie theaters, yes. Does that answer your Movie question? theaters, but not <clears throat> if someone's putting on a, a play, you know. Not that type. Right. No. That would not be allowed. Okay. Why? And the reason that was because more movie theaters do have that indoor dining. Uh, restaurants right about the theater, you have your meal, then you just walk into the screening room. So they could take advantage of this because, again, they're a responsible operator and they're not going to impact I imagine the maybe in the future it will get more complicated because right. there's plenty of, of playhouses and things like oh. that that have... Yeah. Right. We completely agree. This is what, what I would call putting our toe in the water. Yeah. Just restaurants, not other I, alcohol the, services. The other theaters will start to complain that, right. they, you know, why can I watch my movie here, but I can't watch, you know, my... Yeah. Right. But a lot, a lot of those venues, or some of those venues, also have bands. So it's kind of like, and then people dance. It's, you know, as yeah. Bob said, we're tiptoeing in. We don't want it to be a very raucous thing. They, it's still available, the conditional use permit, but... And, and just, yeah. No, go ahead. And I'll just remind everyone that a, an operating kitchen has to be in, at the site as well. So a movie theater like the Arclight in Hollywood has a restaurant inside the movie theater. So that's more of the style that we're looking at versus, uh, you know, taking a drink in from the concession stand and going in to watch a live play. Um, I did, but you can explain. Oh, let me explain the MVIP program. Currently, if you're selling alcohol, you get a conditional use uh, from the city. Um, as you've heard, now, we don't put term limits on these conditional uses to allow them to run in perpetuity, but in order to go back and review them, they do sign in their covenant to a condition called the MVIP program. In a year and a half, we send building safety out to verify all the conditions. Year and a half after operations, not entitlement, because we want to see how they're operating. If they're okay, then they move on. And that's for all conditional use permits. That same program is being applied to these. Okay. So. When you come to the counter, get your sign off, and you record your covenant, that condition is going to be in there, and you will be inspected in a year and a half. And then you mentioned, it's mentioned hotels. 
Does that include mini bars, uh, room service, or just bona fide restaurants? I think this is just the restaurant portion. Again, we're taking a small step on this um, to roll it just, out. Just trying to understand. I can, yeah. um, and then in terms of um, some of the limitations were, I wondered about, the, the full camera surveillance system. Do the mom and pop restaurants have these? Are they necessary in everywhere? That's a standard condition. Currently, we apply to all conditional uses uh, just for safety reason, reasons. Same thing, like no loitering signs? I think like those are going to be in there, a, too. A, yes. Like a look like blight, but... Right, they're going to be... Those kind of conditions would be into these over-the-counter ones. Okay. They'd be and what, you said? They'd be embedded. When you come to the counter to get your sign-off, they're embedded into a covenant agreement that you agree to and record against the property. So... Um, and, they're, and they're quite often in, uh, part of our conditions of approval anyway through the discretionary process. So we're just being as conservative as possible to make sure that our, these standards are the, are the most heavily used conditions that we impose through the discretionary process. We can't pick and choose when or, when or not to do it. This has to be across the board. So we quite often do impose cameras and, you know, please be quiet, our neighbors are listening, those kinds of signs. And then there's the, the prohibition on coin-operated games. It seems like a little bit of an inequity. Uh, does that include credit card games? <laughs> I, I think it includes anything that's defined as a game in the current code. Yeah, I mean, and, and that could get, you know, I know, like, uh, what's the restaurant? I go to different restaurants with my kids, and they have, yeah, um, front, they have, like, the machine where you go and you put, put a dollar in, and you try to pick up a little stuffed animal from the, the claw or something, but that's in major restaurants. How does that, that would invalidate them? Um, Charlie, is that a game of chance? Didn't we limit it to three? Was there a limit of three of them? Any more than three? It's a conditional use permit. So, the, so but this did not say that. This says none. Okay. Right. Right. And Charlie Rush, uh, I just wanted to say, we have different zones. Uh, so like a C4 zone, which I universally call the no fun zone, prohibits any kind of gaming machines in them, but a lot, a lot of times restaurants will go into a C4 zone and not know that, so that's why we sometimes put a condition on that says no gaming machines in it. So it's basically so they don't run afoul of building and safety, and they also bring a different kind of clientele. I, I know you're talking about the claw, but... <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a bunch of these kid restaurants yeah. that... that Restaurants that actually serve alcohol, like I'm trying to think of the name, but, or uh, well, a Chuck E. Cheese, restaurant. yeah, a Chuck E. Chuck cheese, cheese would be pizza. probably not what we're looking for for something like this, right? But like a Red Robin, which mm -hmm. is um, yeah. they serve alcohol, right. they have the little machine in front, uh, you know, kids play with, but I guess if they're going to take advantage of this, they can't have any of those machines. Is that the idea? The point is not to have the ones that are going to attract a nuisance, not a video game machine that's banked one whole wall. That's what we're trying to avoid. Right, but this says nothing, right? Now. This says I, I think it's kind of hard to sometimes differentiate it. As we work this through the process, the hearing process, we're going to hear more from the industry groups to see what works, what doesn't work, and that can be refined. It might be reasonable to just limit the number of them to three or two or one, but we don't know yet. I, I don't know. It just jumps out. No, that's, I think that's a good point. You know, why? Kids that age, I go to a bunch of these these <laughs> awful places, but they do serve alcohol, which is good for the parents. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes <Yeah>. necessary. Yes. <laughs> but they have a few of these games, but right. they're not typically your nuisance. Right. 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 But there are are there are also establishments where these places are very large, and they don't cater just to little kids. They cater to like college kids playing skee ball, and Davis. so I think we wanted to not have that go through the process. But right. I think your point is well taken. And then and then some of the legitimate Russians have like live piano music or someone providing, you know, ambient guitar music. Do we really want to prohibit that? Well, well, the intent I, is live entertainment where you have a band come in because that's typically going to be a little more impactful to an area. Again, we're going to have to define what is live entertainment. Normally, if you have a restaurant, someone's walking through the restaurant with a guitar just playing lightly, that's typically allowed. We don't consider that not necessarily live entertainment, that's ambient music. And as long as it's not amplified with a speaker system, that's permitted currently. So there is there is an ambient music difference between live entertainment and ambient music? Oh, absolutely, I, yes. I know that. That's interesting. So, so you still could have a piano player 
just playing background music yes. in the corner. That's not considered the primary source of entertainment. That's more ambient music. Mm. And again, the key sometimes is if it's amplified. Mm. Okay, because because it does say when you read it, it just says like live or live music, music or yeah. live piano music. music. Okay. Um, From previous experiences as a zoning administrator, that is often something that is uh, an issue. Uh, we don't need a conditional use permit for live music in a, in, a, in a restaurant or the like, but it's something that they mention on public hearing notices. And surprisingly, that becomes a, a, a fairly large issue on some of these alcohol permits, uh, the playing of live music. So we generally will have something for um, ambient music that somebody has playing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> that somebody has playing, you know, um, off of an MP3 player or something like that, but you start getting, it's very difficult to regulate that because all of a sudden, when does the piano player become a mariachi band or something like that, which may not be um, right. How do you determine amplified, that? but certainly makes a lot of harpsichord is playing lightly. In the yeah, exactly. It, it's very difficult to, so I mean, when you're doing something where we're trying to do just gives an over-the-counter kind of thing, it's just to start differentiating between that becomes extremely difficult for both people at the counter and the Department of Building and Safety and enforcing. Yeah. So it's, it's... Highlighted as it would be a pity to, to end yep. up wiping out all these folks who provide ambient music um, because people want to get these licenses and then Right. You know, now we're just going to play louder music through somebody's MP3 player right. when you could have, you know, that right. artist that has a hard time finding a job. Well, even in the best of, or the most uh, egregious, they could um, at least get the restaurant open. You know, they could start, and if they really want to have a live music venue, they could go through the conditional use process. It'll just take a little longer, but the restaurant could be open. They can have beer and wine or full line, and they can have a business, and then yeah. starting and we take next care month, we'll have a piano yeah. player. Yeah, well, we take care of that through a plan approval, not through a full conditional use permit, so. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Blumenfield covered almost everything I wanted to talk about. Um, I wanted to put a little finer point on the outdoor dining, though. Um, and you, you started to touch on this with the definition of how it has to abut. Um, if the if the concern is the impact of noise and behavior in the outdoor dining area, um, but the residential area abuts the rear of the property, um, as ha is the case in virtually every business on Ventura Boulevard, for example, where there's outdoor dining on the major boulevard, then there's the back of the property, there's an alley, and then there's an R zone. So um, I actually am not concerned about those situations. Those are the situations that I think we, we would want to welcome. Um, so I wonder if there had been thought to um, defining that in a way so that the uh, standard term 25 uh, doesn't include, um, doesn't prohibit uh, outdoor dining if the project is abutting or across an alley from the zone, but rather the outdoor dining area is abutting uh, or across an alley. Can you, is that well, feasible to do? That was brought up also in our discussions at length. And right now, I think we all have it in our head, the outdoor dining is at the rear. What if the outdoor dining is on the side and the building is on the other side of the, it's a rectangular lot, but it's on the side now it creates a channel. You may move that outdoor dining all the way to the front, but it's like a little echo chamber shooting to the back. You could have that situation along Ventura Boulevard. Um, so again, we were trying to find, is there a balance? Currently, I don't think we found it, but not to say there isn't, um, but it could be something we can look into, definitely. Because again, people on Ventura Boulevard, outdoor dining in the right-of-way, in the very front of the building, everybody wants, kind of wants that, and that's probably the least impactful right. in the rear. But how do you prevent that from being on the side in the front and still channeled all the way to the back? And I, I don't want to be prescriptive about this because, yeah. you know, I, I, I trust your judgment in figuring out the... But I think we want to encourage that sort of business 
in a in a commercial area like that, and I, I would hate to put them at a sort of competitive disadvantage uh, through this process if there's a way that we can feasibly do that. So I would ask that you you know have a deeper look on on that issue and try and come up with something. Um, and then the other thing um, I think we should add to this is because this has be is will be a ministerial process and you know communities won't have their expected usual level of input uh, in this I think that it would be um, important to have the neighborhood councils uh, for the uh, project area at least be informed um, so to, if we can add a, a perspective standard limitation that would require the planning department to provide notification to the neighborhood council of an application in their area along with the standard limitations that the building will uh, that the business would have to abide by so um, at least they know what's coming at least they know that that these are uh, happening and that they also know that th this isn't happening without standard limitations I think it, it's it will actually be helpful for all of you if the neighborhood councils know that despite this expedited process the standardized the standard limitations are still going to apply and it's still going to be darn close to what would happen right. if not you know greater limitation than what would happen through a CUP process um, that might give some comfort, I think, to communities who might otherwise be concerned about an expedited process. So, Mr. Bloomfield, any other no, suggestions? No, okay, with those uh, two amendments, then I would ask that um, I would propose that we instruct the planning department, with the assistance of the city attorney, to begin drafting an ordinance amending zoning code sections 12.22 and 12.24 to create an administrative approval process for business that meet the prospective standard limitations uh, as amended and to hold staff level public hearings and then to report back to the ad hoc jobs committee and the planning and land use management uh, committee uh, with that draft ordinance so and uh, without objection that will be the action of myself and mr. Blumenfield uh, not not quite the committee but a moment delay but come back. Yeah. What if, I don't know if there's a way to look into the defining the ambient music a little better maybe there's a way to do that with the, the level decibel level or something like that so that so that there is a way to keep ambient music as part of this without you know stepping it up to the live the live music because I just in some ways ambient music may be less of a nuisance than if if everybody starts yep. putting in live sound systems or it could be the reverse if the ambient music is, you know, performed by ten musicians at once. <laughs> so, so um, if if there's some statutory definition or something that might be useful, maybe you yeah. could consider that in drafting the ordinance. But um, I, th I think it's worth taking a harder look at that as well. Great. So, thank you. Um, right. Pardon me, Mr. Yes. Chair. Would the committee's action be to approve the report or to note and file the report or just to provide those uh, instructions? Um, do we need to? Oh. Yeah. Okay. I think I think we just move forward with the preparation of the ordinance at this point. Oh, and for the record, this would be a communication from yourself, the chair, and from Councilmember Blumenfeld, a member. Yes, it would. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, there being no other business before the committee, no, we are adjourned. <laughs>